Welcome to the amazing Bump to Roughness, which was developed by Pixar Animation Studios. And the Bump to Roughness feature really solves a common problem in computer graphics that bump and displacement maps can look different when rendered from various distances. So when an object is further away from the camera, sometimes the beautifully detailed and intricate textured surfaces can be filtered away, which in turn makes the surface look plastic or smooth. Now, the Bump to Roughness system in RenderMan solves this problem by using a special Bump to Roughness map, which drives the bump and roughness values and then mixes between them depending on how close or far away to the object the camera is. So let's have a look at Bump to Roughness in action. And here in Nuke, you can see I've got these two chrome bowling balls. The one on the left here is using the Bump to Roughness node, and the one on the right here is using the same map, but it's actually using the more conventional and standard Bump and Roughness techniques. And these are both rendered with the same Pixar surface and using the Chromium preset. So all looks good and they're both roughly the same. Now you will always find a little bit of visual difference between using a bump to roughness node here on the left and using standard bump and roughness maps. So this is where the magic starts to happen. And I've rendered this animation out where the balls start to move further away from the camera. So if I then skip forward a frame in this animation, you can see that the balls start to move further away. And they're both retaining their detail pretty well and they both look roughly the same as each other. But if I skip forward one more frame, what you can start to see on the more traditional method on the right hand side here is that we're starting to lose this detail. And on the left hand side with the bump to roughness map, you can see that the scratches and the detail is actually being retained really nicely. So again, if I step forward a frame and move the balls further away, you can start to see that the bump to roughness node is really now starting to keep its detail, whereas the traditional bump and roughness method here on the right, we've lost all these scratches here and it's starting to look smooth. And again, if I move another frame forward, the, the bump to roughness ball here is really retaining its detail. But on here on the right, it's actually starting to look more like a smooth chrome ball than a heavily scratched chrome ball. And again, if I really start to move the balls further away from the camera, you can start to see it. And it might be difficult on the screen here, but you can see subtly down here that actually the bump to roughness is really retaining its roughness. And the standard technique is actually looking pretty smooth and chrome-like. So what happens is that as you start to move objects further away from the camera, RenderMan starts to use the roughness values of the map. And so at this point, it's, only, it's not really using the bump values, it's actually using roughness. And if I skip back some frames, now what happens is as we start to get closer to the balls, it then starts to use the bump values instead of the roughness values. And so as we start to get closer and closer, we're retaining this really nice bump and scratches all the way through an animation. And so this bump to roughness technique is really useful for objects and characters that are moving from various distances away and towards the camera. And so if you're using the standard technique of the bump and roughness maps, what happens is that you probably need to set your bump and roughness values depending on how close the camera it was. So if we look here, you would probably adjust your bump and roughness values so that this looked good when the character or the object was close to the camera. And then as it started to move further away from the camera, you probably have to go back and adjust those values. Whereas with a bump to roughness map, you don't need to adjust those values really. You just need to let Render Man do its magic. And so now I've showed you the visual advantages to using the bump to roughness maps, you're all probably asking yourself, well, when should I use them and how does Pixar use them? Well, Pixar uses bump to roughness maps a lot and they use them on all sorts of surfaces ranging from micro car paint scratches to carbon fiber weave through to fabric and also skin pores and even environmental objects such as road, concrete and marble. And so the way to think about your bump to roughness maps is they really add that extra layer of realism. And not only that, but they also require fewer samples to render, so you even see a reduction in your render times. Plus, not only can you drive the bump and the roughness values from one map, but you can also use the same map to drive anisotropy and anisotropy direction as well. But one thing to take into consideration about bump to roughness maps is that actually the file size of them is pretty large, so you need to take that into account when using them on your production. Okay, so here we are in Maya, and before I get started and show you how you plug in a bump to roughness node, first thing I'll show you is actually what a bump to roughness map actually looks like. So the first thing you can see here is this is actually the scratch map that I've been using. And then let me show you what the bump to roughness map looks like itself. So here I've already got it loaded in. And now you can see that actually it looks really interesting and very, very different to how possibly you might expect. 
And if you open up the channels tab, you can see here that it actually contains four more channels. And so these channels within the bump to roughness map, these are actually the sort of secret source that makes all the magic happen. So when you press render. Now let's have a look at how you actually plug in a bump to roughness map. So this is the same material as I used in the demonstration earlier. And as you can see, I've taken out all the diffuse color. I set the Fresnel mode to physical and I set the preset for the refraction and the extinction coefficient to chromium. Now here you can see we've got this bump to roughness node. I've already gone ahead and plugged in the texture that I wanted to use. Now, like all textures within RenderMan, all I needed to do was choose the original texture file and the texture manager goes ahead and automatically converts it to its special bump to roughness texture. So like I say, I've already done this because it takes a little moment and I didn't want to slow this video down. And so I've also used this Pixar hex tar manifold to control the repetition of my scratches when I apply it to the bowling ball. So as you can see here, we have a number of outputs. The first we've got our normals, then we've got result roughness, then we've got anisotropy, and then we've got anisotropy direction. So all I do to initially wire this up is I take the result roughness and I plug this into the specular roughness of our Pixar surface. And now you can start to see that it's applying some roughness. And then I just take the, the result N out and I plug it into my bump normal. Okay, so now let's go ahead and have a look at some of these parameters within the bump to roughness node. So the first tab here, this is where you determine which texture you want to use as your bump to roughness texture. And then here we have our manifold. And you can see here that plugged into the multi manifold is I'm using this hex tile manifold, which I showed you earlier. Now under bump to roughness tab, this is really where all the magic happens. And so the first parameter here is base roughness. And like the tab says, this controls your base roughness. And so at the minute it's set to 0.01, but if we go up a little higher and we go to 0.1, now what you can start to see is that we're starting to increase the roughness of our metal. And if we just go back and revert this back to its default value of 0.001, now we've got quite a chrome-like material. So next up here we have texture roughness. This is set to default to minus one. And when it's set to minus one, what it's doing is it's taking the natural average of the values that from your input texture, which is this bump to roughness texture here, which we've provided. Now what this is doing is it takes the values and it then controls the roughness of your texture. But if you then want to override this by putting in something like 0.4 or 0.2, what this does is it actually starts to manually set the roughness of your texture. But I'll just go back and set this to its default of minus one. Now next up we have gain. And actually this is actually the roughness gain. So if I take this down to zero, you see that everything disappears. And actually if I remove all the bump as well, now what we end up with is this perfectly smooth chrome ball. So if I then start to increase the gain back up to one, this is now a multiplier for how much roughness is applied. And you know, you can go crazy with it. You can take it up to four or two or whatever values you know, you need to match your reference. But I'm just going to leave this at one. Now bump normal gain, this works in the same way as this other gain. It just defines how much bump is applied to your material. So again, this is set to one. But if you want to go crazy and re have something really scratchy and bumpy, you can then increase the values. And again, here we've got anisotropy gain. But at the minute, we haven't plugged it in. So we'll have a look at this in a minute. So next we have adjust amount and what this does is it allows you to adjust your normals when they're facing away from the camera. And so here then we have surface normal mix and what this does is it allows you to mix in your surface normals. So if I go ahead and set this to one for instance, you can now start to see that all the bump from our chrome bowling ball has actually been removed and all we can see is actually the roughness. But for most cases you can leave this to its default. So let's have a look at the anisotropy. And the first thing we need to do is we need to plug it in. So if we take the result out of our anisotropy and we plug it up here into specular anisotropy, and then if we take out the direction and then down here, we can plug it into specular anisotropy direction. Now what we start to do is we start to stretch and smear our specular highlights, which is driven by this bump to roughness mode. And the anisotropy is really the extra sort of magic part of this node. Not only can you drive the bump and the roughness, but you can also drive the anisotropy as well. And again, like all of these values, you can start to increase them to really emphasize that effect and match that reference that you're working to. So here we've set it to five. And if I just lessen down the bump, 
now you're starting to see something which is really interesting and you can do a lot with one node but like i say the bump to roughness maps themselves are actually quite large in file size so you need to be a little bit careful where and how you use these bump to roughness maps so I hope this lesson has been useful and I'm sure that once you start to explore and dive into the amazing bump to roughness node, you'll start to find some really interesting and creative uses for it.